So um, I'm introducing our next speaker today, who is Gregory Hayworth. Gregory Hayworth is an associate professor of English, history, and computer science at the University of Rochester. He holds BAs from Columbia and Cambridge in English and a PhD in comparative literature from Princeton. Trained as a medievalist, he's an expert in everything dealing with old books, languages, old handwriting, book history, illuminations, manuscript making, and above all, in finding and editing books no one has read in centuries. In 2010, he founded the Lazarus Project as an initiative to recover damaged cultural heritage objects using spectral imaging around the world, having built the first transportable multispectral imaging laboratory. Under Gregory's direction, the Lazarus Project has recovered damaged manuscripts, maps, globes, and paintings using, using multispectral imaging, or MSI, and other technologies in 13 countries from Azerbaijan to Mexico. He and his team have recovered such renowned works, and I apologize if I mispronounce anything, as the Black Book of Carmarthen, the 1491 Martellus Map, the Vercelli Book, the Bronze Age Cave Paintings of Laja Alta, the Gaius Palimpsest of Roman law, and pre-Columbian mixed tech manuscripts of Oaxaca. Uh, he can be seen in two recent documentaries on National Geographic and the History Channel dealing with the search for the lost city of Atlantis. He is disappointed not to have been cast in the recent film Aquaman, King of Atlantis. And one other fun story, while working in the Vatican Library, he smelled smoke on, in, in the wall of the large room in which he was imaging. He located a smoldering electrical short and called the Vatican firemen. After they left, the head curator thanked the Lazarus team for preventing a fire in the library. But don't tell anyone, she said. The headline would read, Vigilant Italian Firefighters Prevent Americans from Burning Down Vatican. And with that's, that a, <laughs> that's a very, very important rule, uh, how to get back uh, from projects uh, with one's reputation intact. Indeed. So go ahead, Professor Hayworth, and I will jump in to warn you when you've got 10 minutes left. Thank you so much. Uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to speak today about the, uh, uh, to all of you folks, about uh, the state of the art of multispectral imaging. Uh, and usually my audience is uh, a group of humanists, uh, most without a background in rare books or library creation. creation. Uh, for them, I usually go very light on the science and very big on the pretty pictures. Uh, which is a shame because most of the excitement and the creativity of multispectral has to do with science, actually. With a group of science librarians, however, I have the rare opportunity to get, well, I guess a bit geeky. No worries, there's going to be plenty of eye candy full of uh, beautiful manuscripts. Uh, but there's also going to be some more in-depth overview of what spectral imaging is about, uh, from the history of the development of the technology, to a, a dive into phenomena like fluorescence and ink chemistry, and then of course, issues of conservation. As science librarians, uh, most, if not all of you have some familiarity with multispectral imaging already, whether it be from the Archimedes Palimpsest project or one or another of the many recoveries of texts and cultural heritage objects that have been reported on in the media and in journals. Most of you uh, also have objects in your collections, whether they're books or manuscripts or paintings or various other objects, uh, which are damaged or partly legible. Some of you, no doubt, have been in the position of deciding how to handle these objects, uh, what to do about them, uh, how to present them, or you've been consulted on possible solutions or possible imaging projects. Uh, or perhaps uh, you're considering purchasing an MSI system for your library and uh, uh, maybe you're in uh, discussions with uh, larger groups there. My talk today is designed to give you the necessary information about the state of the art in multispectral imaging so that you can make those decisions about objects and technologies in, in an informed way. So what is multispectral imaging? Well, on its most basic level, uh, a method, it's a method for photographing cultural heritage objects, manuscripts and paintings mostly, what I call uh, textual objects, something that has a narrative to them. Uh, and these objects have been damaged or uh, painted over or written over uh, by, sometimes they, they've been damaged also by, uh, by use, by fading, by water, 
by charring. Sometimes they've been damaged by uh, chemical reagents or scratched out and overwritten, uh, what we know is, a, a, of course, is a palimpsest. And by taking a sequence of photographs under various wavelengths of light, both in the visible part of the spectrum and in the invisible, that is uh, ultraviolet and near infrared, details that are normally invisible to the naked eye can often become visible. And of course, that's only part of the process because not only do you have to capture the images, but then you have to process them. Uh, and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, mostly the capture and the technology of it and some of the physics of, of that side, but I'll be making reference near the end of the talk to uh, how these projects actually, uh, uh, actually involve teams and, and, and what that actually looks like. Uh, one of the most famous manuscripts, uh, as you probably well know, uh, which was recovered by multispectral imaging is the Archimedes palimpsest. In 1229, scribes in Jerusalem decided to reuse some parchment that they had left over from an old manuscript that uh, no one was using because, well, they probably couldn't read it or they, it wasn't particularly uh, visible. And they scraped the ink off the old text, perhaps washed it in some way, turned it 90 degrees, and then copied the text of a Greek prayer book onto it. Uh, what they didn't realize was that the old text included several treatises by the Greek, uh, Greek mathematician Archimedes, three of which, the stomachion, the method of mechanical theorems and on floating bodies, existed in no other copies. These three works demonstrated that Archimedes had used an early form of calculus 2000 years before Newton discovered it. And uh, the, uh, the reason that we have these texts today is that a team of imaging scientists led by my colleague, uh, friend and colleague, Roger Easton, uh, professor of imaging science at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and Keith Knox, a former Xerox researcher and uh, University of Rochester PhD, used and developed new multispectral imaging techniques uh, and to a lesser extent, X-ray fluorescence to enhance the erased under text. I've been fortunate to have worked with both of them for nearly 15 years now. And as the director of the Lazarus Project at the University of Rochester, uh, I've completed hundreds of recoveries of manuscripts, maps, globes, and paintings uh, from around the world, as my uh, uh, bio uh, suggested. Uh, what's really important about the Archimedes Palimpsest is that it inaugurated, I think, uh, a kind of new renaissance in uh, imaging technologies as a way of presenting to the public objects of great value, which are hard to talk about and hard to read. Uh, and which is on the one hand, uh, a, a wonderful uh, research uh, opportunity for libraries, but also a, uh, a teaching opportunity as well. And these are some of the aspects that I'd like to be exploring today. Now, as recent and exotic as the field of cultural heritage imaging may seem, in fact, the idea behind it goes back to the very beginning of the history of photography. Oh. Hold on, yes, that's what I wanted to show. I should have shown that before. Uh, the person you're looking at here is William Henry Fox Talbot, uh, who was, uh, he, he was a, 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 an early experimenter and developer of photographic techniques uh, about 10 years. It's about the same time as Daguerre. Uh, he was the first to use paper. He also did salt prints. Um, he was, um, uh, a prolific scholar as well, not simply in the sciences, but also in the humanities. He was one of the uh, decipherers of cuneiform, uh, specifically Ugarit cuneiform, and so had a very interesting uh, balance between uh, interest in cultural heritage and antiquity and interested in, interest in, uh, in the sciences. Uh, his major early publication uh, was the Pencil of Nature, uh, and it's the first commercially available book which is illustrated with photographs. And he was also the first to photograph manuscripts and, uh, to, and to do so with the purpose of not only preserving them and sharing them, but also to uh, help uh, scholars read them more effectively. Here is a, a plate from the statutes of Richard II, written if you're trying to read it in, uh, in French, in Norman French. And uh, it is one of these, one of these uh, documents which 
uh, seems to support his contention that the antiquarian, that to the antiquarian, this application of photographic art seems to be destined uh, uh, to be a great advantage. And in fact, in that respect, he was certainly one of the fathers of multispectral imaging. But he was also more than that. Also in the, uh, in the pencil of nature, Talbot uh, dedicates an entire page to speculating on the use of prisms uh, to uh, create or separate wavelengths that are both visible and invisible. And he was among the first to recognize the presence and value of invisible wavelengths. And he proposed a photographic thought experiment in which these invisible rays, which we later came to call ultraviolet and infrared, could be used to image cultural heritage objects in a new way. Now, it would take another 70 years before Talbot's thought experiment would become a reality. Uh, Although digital imaging and image processing is only about 25 years old, analog multispectral imaging is over a century old. Uh, in 1913, uh, Gustav Kögel, a Benedictine monk from the monastery of Beuhon in far southern Germany, Rheinland-Pfalz, filed a, pa a, a, a patent, Verfahren zum Beleuchten von Fotografisch aufzunehmen Palimpsesten, or the method for illuminating palimpsests for photographic capture. And the first paragraph I have uh, read up here, by using either ultraviolet light alone or with visible light in conjunction with photography, certain undertexts and palimpsests will be different differentiated sufficiently from the overtext to make them clearly visible. What he did was uh, uh, almost single-handedly invent the first multispectral imaging system. And this is what it looked like. Here's uh, Kogel's camera. Uh, he has you know, a bellows camera, very similar in some respects to what we have today, although an analog version of it. Um, and uh, it has uh, an ultraviolet absorbing filter, a condensing lens. Uh, he has uh, a broad band mercury vapor uh, lamps, and uh, then this absorbing filter at U. So he has this very carefully uh, laid out setup, which is designed to separate various wavelengths of light in interesting ways. And what Kogel realized, perhaps without understanding exactly the physics behind it, was that fluorescence is really the key, one of the keys to the success of multispectral photography. Uh, one of the really interesting things that he did is, is to use prisms to separate uh, enough UV so that when it, uh, so that it could be projected onto a palimpsest, and uh, it would have uh, enough power actually to cause fluorescence in uh, in the parchment. And this is an example. It's it's from his his uh, patent application of of what he was actually able to do. And with this, he used uh, liquid transmission filters. Today, and I'm gonna be talking about this a little bit later on, we use thin gel filters. And of course, in your cameras, you uh, all have filters. But here, uh, this, uh, he had this, this, this glass cuvette, uh, which at, was filled with uh, a, a liquid, which allowed only certain wavelengths to pass through. Uh, and this is his band pass filter, about which I'm gonna be speaking more. Now, I should say that uh, Kögel went on to found a palimpsest research institute at Beuron and for profit uh, throughout Europe, beginning in 1914 and ending probably in the mid 1950s. He ran an institute which used his system to, um, uh, to recover palimpsests and, uh, and, and print them. Uh, after the war, uh, his uh, system was taken over by the, the uh, classicist Alban Dold uh, at, at Beuron, who continued his work. And the reason Dold actually had to take, take over for him is that Kögel, although he was a brilliant guy, was actually a pretty unpleasant man as well. He turned out to be a vicious Nazi, and uh, he was uh, he committed suicide right before he was about to be tried in Nuremberg trials. trials. So um, although we owe him a, a hell of a lot, he's, um, he's one of those pe people whose place in history is, is, uh, is an uncertain one. Uh, what, I, what I want to point out, though, is that 
his understanding of the role of fluorescence is going to play a crucial role in the evolution of uh, cultural heritage imaging. And uh, as in modern systems, uh, Kögel designed the system of bandpass filters. Uh, and these bandpass filters are really crucial for separating fluorescence from reflected light. For 90 years, Kögel's multispectral system, uh, which was basically a broadband white light with filters, remained largely unchanged. Uh, in fact, there are systems today which are basically the same as Kögel's. Uh, and indeed, the principles of multispectral imaging that he developed are those of the state-of-the-art digital systems that we use today. In describing the state-of-the-art and why it represents an important improvement over broadband methods still employed uh, today in many low-end MSI systems, I want to return briefly to the basic principles of physics that Kögel so effectively exploited, UV fluorescence and uh, ultimately to infrared. Uh, above, in the two images you see here, are two pioneers in the physics of fluorescence, John Herschel and George Stokes, both mathematicians at Cambridge during the mid to the late 19th centuries. In 1845, uh, Sir John Herschel published the first account of what later came to be known as fluorescence. And he was looking at, uh, at a solution of quinine in water. And he noticed the following. Though perfectly transparent and colorless, when held between the eye and the light of, or, or a white object, it yet exhibits in certain aspects and under certain incidences of light, an extremely vivid and beautiful celestial blue color. And uh, I have images here, which actually demonstrate uh, just that. And you can do the same experiment that Herschel had done at home with a bottle of tonic water uh, and a black light, uh, which uh, of course tonic water gets its, its bitter flavor from quinine. And it does indeed, as in the image here above, turn celestial blue. So how does this actually work? And I think we should take a moment to explore uh, exactly how it works and then come back to filters and understand why state-of-the-art imaging uh, requires uh, filters and what they can actually do to the quality of data that we get from multispectral. Ultraviolet light, as in the example above, can cause fluorescence in a variety of materials, including cloth, page, paper, and parchment. Of course, lacking the modern model of the atom developed by Rutherford and Bohr in 1913, Herschel didn't know precisely how fluorescence worked. Basically, uh, ultraviolet light is a short energetic wavelength that bombards an object, let's say a piece of parchment with photons. Those photons hit the electrons in the outer shell of atoms in the parchment, knocking them down one shell. The atom then, after a very tiny pause, re-emits energy in the form of light. Or in other words, the parchment starts to glow. Now, two things about fluorescence in manuscripts are crucial to understanding why multispectral imaging works. First, uh, the two main types of ancient ink, iron gall ink and carbon ink, both absorb UV and do not fluoresce, uh, fluoresce. In fact, they quench fluorescence, and that's really important. Instead, it's the parchment or paper around the ink that can glow brightly when it fluoresces. Even when the ink is degraded, erased, or most, mostly washed away, whatever remains appears suddenly much darker in contrast to the bright parchment around it, making the text more le legible. Here, for example, is a folio from a manuscript prepared by uh, the famous Otto Ege, the, the book breaker, who in the mid 19th, uh, 20th century uh, created a series of composite manuscripts, which he sold throughout the United States, uh, uh, of leaves taken from a variety of, uh, of manuscripts. Uh, and this one is from the Carey Collection at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And as you can see, uh, it's a pristine example of a 15th century bre breviary. Uh, it looks, uh, you know, uh, nondescript, but very, very pretty and, and very clean. But when RIT students imaged it with a relatively simple multispectral system of their own design using UV fluorescence, this is a couple of years ago. Uh, this uh, is what happened. 
this is the fluorescence uh, that uh, um, is is now you know, elicits this, this, this text, which was palimpsested. It's, it's actually an interesting thing, this particular uh, phenomenon, because the, uh, I looked at it and I realized that the breviary I dated to about uh, uh, 1430 and the undertext of the palimpsest I date to about 1420. So this is an extremely unusual and rare thing, rare object, which I'm still studying. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I'd said that the, the two things about fluorescence in manuscripts, which are crucial to understanding why multispectral imaging works, uh, is that the first is, uh, you know, that the iron gall and uh, carbon ink absorb fluorescence. Well, there's a second too. And the second is that fluorescence obeys the rule of the so-called Stokes shift. Following Herschel's discovery, George Stokes recognized that the wavelength of fluorescence that a material emits is actually longer than the wavelength of the light that excites fluorescence. And here in this, this graph, you can see that gap between absorbance and fluorescence and that, that difference is the Stokes shift. Simply put, the object glows a different color from the light that illuminates it. And uh, you know when the parchment is illuminated with say, uh, ultraviolet at 365 nanometers. Uh, generally, when we look at it, it looks yellowish green, which means the light that's glowing is at about 550 nanometers. That means that the Stokes shift for parchment, most parchments, is somewhere around 185 nanometers. So why is the Stokes shift important for multispectral imaging? Well, you remember when I said that the crucial thing about fluorescence is that the ink doesn't fluoresce and the parchment does fluoresce. And therefore that in fluorescence, faded text on a manuscript is the darkest it can be. That means that the pure fluorescence emitted by the manuscript carries the clearest images of the hidden text. What we want therefore is just the fluorescence. We don't want the reflected light which provokes the fluorescence. So the pure fluorescence by, emitted by the manuscript is exactly what we want and nothing else. Now, unfortunately, the camera, camera, however, sees a mixture of emitted fluorescence and reflected UV or blue light, which is usually what we use to provoke fluorescence either in various wavelengths between UV and blue. And uh, this, is, uh, this is ultimately uh, what you're seeing in the image above. We have uh, in, this is a, a kind of mock-up of a, a, an early version of our system where you have illumination from LEDs uh, and uh, they hit an object uh, and they bounce up into the camera. Uh, and if they are in the UV or blue, they provoke a fluorescence uh, in which the light also bounces up, the reflected light bounces up, but the, the fluorescence also comes up mixing with that light. Uh, so here, the, in our system, the light panels illuminate the manuscript sequentially in up to 18 different wavelengths, including multiple UV and blue bands that, as I said, provoke the fluorescence. And you may see right below the camera, see that the, the camera has, I don't have a pointer uh, here uh, that I think you can see, but uh, there, is a, there are blue bellows and then there's the lens. And right underneath that is a, a filter wheel. And this filter wheel cont contains a series of band, band pass filters, similar in some regards to what Kögel had used, uh, that are designed to separate the UV light from the longer fluorescence that it provokes, and then to let through only a narrow sliver of that fluorescence, depending on the color of the filter. And uh, what you're looking at now is a graph showing the spectral range of a band pass filter that's in that filter wheel. As you can see, uh, between roughly uh, 615 and 625, so in the uh, in, you know, lower red, orange red to red, what you're seeing is uh, uh, the, the filter is, is letting through all of that light and it's blocking out everything else. In other words, it's blocking out the UV light, which is at a lower uh, wavelength, which is provoking that fluorescence. And it's giving us just a really narrow sliver of, uh, of data 
uh, which is exactly what we want. The modern MSI system used by the Lazarus project shown a moment ago contains six different band pass filters that rotate in two wheels in conjunction with a series of exposures in various wavelengths, 365 nanometers, 385, 400, 420, and 450. So what happens is that the system uh, uh, will start with 365 and will take a series of images and each series will rotate the, the filter wheel uh, and we will get a slightly different, uh, very, very narrow tranche of fluorescence. Yeah. And then we move up a uh, uh, wavelength and uh, to say 385, and we do the same. And each of these filters isolates, as I said, a very narrow color within the fluorescence. So that with the changes in wavelength, we get a series of images that show pure fluorescence in up to 30 different narrow bands or colors. And this is how it works. Uh, I've tried to uh, um, create a, an animated version of it. You have uh, the light which hits the pat parchment, uh, provokes fluorescence in the red and the green, as you can see. Uh, and yet there's some reflected light uh, uh, in the blue and the, the UV, which also bounces off. The filters reject the UV and blue, but they allow the emitted fluorescence to pass through. Um, so, uh, uh, so far, uh, so, so uh, at, at the end of this, we have, you know, uh, these, these narrowed filter bands, which we found often contain the clearest images of hidden text, uh, because mostly it's noise, which prevents us from seeing the ideal, the perfect fluorescence. So far, I've talked mostly about one invisible wavelength, the shorter wave ultraviolet. Also important, however, is longer wave infrared light. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the same kind of uh, light used in night vision goggles. Uh, and it affects manuscripts in two very particular ways. First, because the wavelength is longer than UV or visible light, it can penetrate more deeply into the manuscript. That means it can see through dirt and surface discolorations, stains, charring, and even paste downs. And this is really crucial for the curator. If you have an object which is charred, uh, stained, or is hidden under a paste down, IR imaging is uh, what's going to bring that out. Let me give you an example. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls here uh, that you see, these two fragments, uh, are images almost exclusively in infrared. Uh, they are written in carbon ink, which remains black throughout the infrared. I should say that uh, iron gall ink uh, starts to fade in infrared, and we'll see that in just a moment. Uh, whereas carbon ink, which is an older style of ink, uh, is, remains black all the way up through the mid, mid IR at about 3000 nanometers. And this brings me to that second effect of infrared on manuscripts. Carbon ink, I, as I said, is unaffected uh, uh, but infrared causes iron gall ink to fade and ultimately by about a thousand nanometers, uh, it disappears almost entirely, sometimes entirely. That means that one can use infrared, infrared light to distinguish between types of ink that to the eye look exactly the same. Uh, there are, for example, a variety of very inexpensive tools or flashlights, infrared flashlights that you can use or UV flashlights. Uh, but infrared, for example, uh, will uh, enable you as a curator to see uh, whether or not uh, uh, an ink is iron gall or carbon ink. If it's iron gall uh, under the infrared, it will disappear or fade. In this 13th century Torah that we imaged uh, a few years ago, and it now belongs to the Museum of the Bible, the original text was written in iron gall ink. It was retouched over a series of years, which by the way, uh, Torahs are not supposed to be <laughs> retouched, uh, but this one was, uh, uh, with various parts rewritten and enhanced. And they were written enhanced in carbon ink. By looking at the infrared at 940 nanometers, uh, one can immediately see that the letters, uh, the letters and words which were changed and rewritten, which you would not have been able to tell with a naked eye. Notice in particular, the letter P. Uh, that's rewritten sometimes with these little crowns on the upper part of the leaf. Now, 
By combining the enhancement of fluorescence from the UV with the ability to see through dirt and charring of the infrared, multispectral imaging can uh, pr uh, produce some spectacular reveals. So the, the, the idea of multispectral isn't to use just a single band in, in isolation, but to combine the, uh, the powers of various characteristics of light at various ends of the spectrum. Uh, and the example that I want to show from you uh, sh show to you is from the collection of Ohio State University. And we imaged it, oh, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years ago, probably now. Um, and uh, it had been processed by combining several UV and IR bands. And this is a, as you can see, it's a black and binding, binding actually, which uh, had been probably painted over. Uh, and when we originally looked at it, we, we weren't sure the kinds of results we'd get. But uh, by processing, by combining the UV and IR bands, we are able to recover basically uh, all of the text. Now, one of the important features of modern state-of-the-art multispectral systems is the ability to capture images, not only in reflectance, that is from light coming down from the top from, from these, uh, you know, uh, these uh, uh, plates of LEDs, and also in fluorescence, that is, uh, uh, you know, causing fluorescence using a filter wheel, but also in transmission. And what you're looking at here is an early version of a light sheet that we currently use that slides under every individual folio of the manuscript, illuminating it in five wavelengths from below and up through the leaf itself. Uh, lacking UV bands, whose wavelengths are too short to penetrate the thickness of most parchment paper. The transmissive here is particularly effective in the infrared, which as a longer wavelength penetrates much more deeply and powerfully, and therefore much more light comes through the, uh, uh, the leaf. Infrared, of course, as I've mentioned, also has the effect of causing iron gall ink to become increasingly invisible from around 870 nanometers on. And this is crucial for a really fascinating effect. And it's rare, but it's, it's astounding and transformative. Uh, when we use uh, IR in transmission uh, using this light sheet, often the ink of the undertext of palimpsests, which are very, very old, that is older than about 1,200 years, is that the undertext deteriorates, the iron gall ink deteriorates, leaving only the slightest black traces or often nothing at all, kind of like footprints. Uh, but not before the sulfuric acid in the iron gall ink eats into the parchment, thinning it almost imperceptibly, imperceptibly in the places where the ink has been. So what you see, what you have therefore in, uh, in these really old palimpsests is an overtext, an invisible undertext, but what you can't see is these little thin black footprints of where the letters had been. This is what the IR can bring out. And this is precisely what happened in this Georgian manuscript from St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai. The nearly invisible undertext is an extremely rare sample of the lost language, uh, Caucasian Albanian. And we have only uh, two texts, which, and this is one of them, which, which has Caucasian uh, Albanian uh, in it. Uh, and here, with the aid of transmissive light at 940 nanometers, the iron gall overtext fades into invisibility. Meanwhile, the same IR passes through the thin parchment of the undertext so powerfully that it turns the nearly invisible letters, which you kind of see in the top margin at the gutter and going down in these kind of faint black, black traces uh, into the middle of the text. And it turns, uh, it turns those letters entirely white, revealing the undertext unobscured. This is what it ended up looking like. And when we did this, uh, the, the scholar of Caucasian Albanian, and there are only, I think, three or four in the world, <laughs> Jost Kipat, uh, he gasped and uh, he immediately went upstairs and he started reading. And uh, he said, he came down a few letters, a few, a few, a few, you know, a few minutes later and said, I have now learned a new word uh, in Caucasian Al uh, Albanian, and it's the word fish. Uh, so, Thanks to this image alone, we know how to, now know how to say fish in Caucasian Albanian. I'm sure that was worth uh, you know the, the entire expense of the of the, of the project. Uh, from here, though, I'd like to turn my attention back to the lights and the camera and the lens. And this is my slide, which kind of puts that all together. Not a great slide. There's a lot going on there, 
but I'll leave it up and you can have a look at it uh, because it more or less shows you the various elements, the uh, you know, LED lights, uh, a camera back, uh, a lens, a filter wheel, a manuscript. It doesn't show the transmissive, but that's all right. From Kögel in 1913 until the Archimedes Palimpsest project in the early 2000s, multispectral imaging systems were made pretty much the same. Uh, a broadband white light provided the illumination. Next came filters to separate out multiple bands of light. And for this, Kögel used a prism, but later photographers used colored bandpass filters that went directly in front of the lens. And finally came the camera, which for most of the period meant a black and white analog camera with film instead of a sensor. The image would take multiple the imager would take multiple shots of the same image, changing filters to get different narrow wavelengths. Today, the technology has changed in two ways: digital cameras and light from LEDs. Mostly are the main differences. Capturing an image digitally means that it's recorded as a series of numeric values at each pixel, enabling researchers to use mathematical processes like subtraction and division and statistical algorithms to refine the image and solve the problem of legibility, kind of like a, a mathematical equation. In the past, broadband white lights like halogen uh, or mercury vapor produced light along with a lot of heat. And th this is still used today. And I, I, I wanna make an a, special, a special point here. Uh, for the most part, UV harms manuscripts in, in, in the amount that is used for imaging, harms manuscripts almost not at all. It's almost imperceptible. We've done quite a few tests. What really harms it is heat. And, uh, and broadband white light illumination in multispectral is something that needs to be consigned to the past. It, uh, it uh, warms up an object by uh, as much as eight to 10 degrees, and uh, that can cause real damage, especially to parchment, something to be avoided. Now, to make the light multispectral uh, in these old systems, imagers needed to filter out most of it into narrow bands. Of course, they have this broadband uh, white light and they use the filters in front of the lens, not for doing fluorescence, but simply for doing basic multispectral. So basically those filters prevent you from doing the kind of fluorescence that we're doing with LEDs. Uh, so uh, they had to make those. And of course, as soon as you filter out most of the, the light from broadband white light, you're losing a huge amount of energy and you're wasting it and harming the manuscript. So all of these are poor solutions to multispectral imaging Some, and, and practices that need to be consigned to the past. Uh, and things that you need to be aware of in looking at multispectral systems. LEDs, by contrast, emit mostly light and very little heat, reducing the potential for da damage dramatically. They also produce narrow bands of light. Finally, with LEDs, because one doesn't use filters to create multispectral light, they can be used to filter and refine fluorescent images using the filter wheel. And here, by the way, is an example of, uh, uh, of what is required with LEDs. It creates complexity. You Gregory, need to give. Gregory, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. You got ten minutes left. Okay, so I, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to move a little bit uh, more quickly then, um, giving that we have is that ten minutes to forty five minutes or ten minutes to fifty? Uh, ten minutes to forty five. Okay, good. All right. Well, what I wanted to talk about uh, in the rest of this uh, 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 process is to talk about uh, the importance of having LEDs in conjunction with. Uh, a, a camera system which can, uh, or a software system which can uh, very effectively create and adjust exposures. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, you may notice is that I've been talking about a system of imaging capture with a monochrome camera, that is a black and white camera. And black and white cameras have some advantages. They have much higher resolution than Bayer array cameras, which have little uh, filters in front of the pixels and only certain of the pixels can be used for blue and red and green. Monochrome is much higher. But if you've been listening carefully, you'll probably be asking the question, how can you make color images uh, with a black and white camera? How is that possible? Excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. And not only is it possible, multispectral imaging systems are capable of producing the most accurate color available. And the reason is that normal camera sensors create color out of three bands, RGB. MSI cameras create color out of multiple bands. We do it out of 10 bands. And that means that the color fidelity of cultural heritage objects imaged by multispectral systems is incredibly high, far, far higher. What you're looking at here is 
uh, a representation of how the human eye perceives differences of color in a multidimensional color space. This was a research done starting in the 1930s by the army. McAdam, an early color scientist, realized that within the ellipses above in that, in that image, the human eye perceives all the colors as basically the same, even though there are gradations and differences. The minimum difference the eye can see is characterized using this model as what's called delta E, the change in emphindum or sensation. And the basic thing is we can see differences up to a delta E of one. The best cameras today taking images of art, for example, have a delta E of five. In other words, they're about 95% accurate. We have a delta E of 0.5. That is, we're 99.5% accurate. So why is color important? Well, a low delta E of MSI enables scholars to evaluate art with aesthetic accuracy. As the object ages, its color changes which is a process of decay that can be observed. And it can also be potentially remediated only if there's an accurate record of the original color. For example, the Dead Sea Scrolls pictured above are in the process of degrading into collagen. Scientists at the Israel Antiquities possess an MSI system nearly identical to the one used by the Lazarus Project. And they use it to monitor and take regular baseline measurements of the material state of the scrolls and to perceive otherwise invisible patterns of decay which can, uh, they can then uh, use to slow the uh, degradation of the object by adjusting the atmosphere in which the scrolls are stored. In my opinion, all collections today, art collections, rare book collections, especially manuscript collections, uh, should employ MSI as a tool both for conservation and for material preservation. And this is one of the things that I hope that you take away uh, from my talk today. I'm gonna skip over uh, the lens uh, an apochromatic lens, uh, and I'm going to focus on uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the systems, uh, two kinds of systems. Uh, I've been describing a high end system, uh, and I'd like to say that the high end system is extremely important. And if you have to, uh, and I want you to be able to distinguish between a high end and low end system and the benefits of each. Um, both systems, of course. Uh, at the high end and low end, need at the very minim minimum LEDs to avoid damage and detriment to the quality uh, caused by broadband white light, white light plus filters. They also need a monochrome camera, and they need to have a, mono uh, a workflow that goes from capture to processing. And of course, proper calibration tools like a color checker and a spectrum. What you're looking at above is a low end system, which I'm very excited about, that is being developed with uh, at, at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology with an NEH grant. And here students are putting some of it together. And the low end features are, uh, uh, are really important. First of all, they're affordable. Your library could probably easily afford it. It costs under $20,000. If you put it together yourself, $6,000. It's easily transportable. Uh, it's very easy to use. And you can train uh, people to use it within a few days, including simple processing software, which are integrated into the capture software. What's it useful for? It's useful for detection of, uh, of a text, which is invisible. And it's very useful also for discovering a baseline of the material state. So this is the kind of conservation that I was talking about that's so important for MSI. The high-end system, and this is the one that we just came back with from, uh, uh, from Verona, the uh, Archivio Capitolare in uh, Verona, which is probably the oldest uh, library in the world, along with St. Catherine's. And this has a special lens, and the features are an apochromatic lens, uh, a filter wheel for fluorescence. It needs to have also a transmissive, and needs to have true 16-bit monochrome uh, camera for discriminating among those thousands of gray levels for high dynamic range. It needs to have software that allows precise control for every element of capture. And it has to be able to composite multi-band color images on capture for the low delta E pictures that scholars need uh, and that are important for digital surrogates and for the record, the historical record. And right now there's only one system uh, that, has, uh, uh, that has that. This is the one that you're looking at. It's made by Megavision. Many high-end systems that you may see are misleading. They present themselves as push button systems. You hit one button and it does it up. And that never ever works for uh, well for high-end images. It, uh, there's a huge amount that's sacrificed. 
uh, the uh, uh, standard, often people will say that there, you know, you can have a standard color imaging system that can also do multispectral with IR and UV. This too is just the opposite of what should happen because they're not going to do uh, color images as well as multispectral uh, and they're going to do multispectral badly. So I, I urge you to watch out if you're thinking of a high-end multispectral system. Uh, and the high-end multispectral systems are useful for high value, badly damaged objects like these. Uh, what you're looking at are two of the most valuable manuscripts, I think, uh, that I've ever done. Uh, and this one is a fifth century or actually fourth century palimpsest in Verona of uh, Euclid uh, and Virgil in the undertext. Uh, and also, uh, just a month ago, we discovered uh, in one of the undertexts of this manuscript, a new Apuleius. Apuleius, of course, wrote The Golden Ass, but here, apparently, he's also written a, a text, uh, uh, which is a commentary on Plato's Republic, Book 10. And this is what we were able to discover. As you can see, it's terribly damaged. It's imaged, uh, damaged by, uh, by two different reagents, Juberti tincture and Ocol reagent, and it's in really terrible condition, and uh, it's a palimpsest. So, uh, uh, yeah, and here's the Gaius manuscript, uh, and here I am, uh, uh, and this is the an, another palimpsest also held at Verona, which is the only record we have of old Roman law, and it's taught in every law school, and there, again, a palimpsest badly damaged. This is what high-end is, is made for. I'll leave you with this. High-end imaging, uh, image capture is only maybe 20% of the path to recovering an object. We've talked about the technology. What I haven't talked about is the fact that at the high end, imaging requires an entire team, a team of scholars and image processors. And here we have our team, including uh, uh, from uh, the right, Emmanuel Zink from the Sorbonne, uh, who's a scholar, Roger Easton from RIT, uh, Dale Stewart from uh, uh, UVAR, uh, uh, Victor Gisonbert from the Sorbonne, Michael Phelps from the Early Manuscripts Electronic Library, and my graduate student, Alex Wacky at the University of Rochester. And here, uh, they're working together. Here's Roger working with Emmanuel. Uh, Roger is one of the imaging scientists, of course. Uh, and they are working very closely in a process that takes a series of months to recover uh, any, any object. So my point is that at the high end, uh, not only do you need to have the technology, but you need to have a dedicated team uh, that works together uh, and that will publish and will make the most out of these invisible objects. Uh, and we're actually, actually at here time. we are. If you want to finish your thought, if you want to finish your thought, go right ahead, but we're at time. Okay, I'll just show you several images of the, the Gaius and what it takes. These are images, uh, what it looks like in, uh, in visible light. And these are some of the multiple images that uh, 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 imaging scientists take to uh, over over you know really a, a long process to recover the text. I hope that this is giving you a sense of the overview and some of the some of the uh, some of the details of modern multispectral imaging. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. That was a very informative and interesting talk. And there's some good questions um, in the chat. Um, please feel free to add your questions uh, as we're talking here. So the first question was actually before you started to talk, um, someone was interested in knowing whether you teach both undergrads and graduate students at your institution. I do indeed. And uh, I teach, uh, uh, and I also bring them along on projects. In fact, we're going to be going to Mexico with some undergraduates. I just uh, came back with graduate students from, from Verona and you saw one of them there. Uh, and I'm gonna be going off and uh, doing the same. So it, it's both a research, a research project, Lazarus project is, and also a teaching, uh, a teaching project. We try to train the next generation of scholars. Are there any other questions? Yes, I'm sorry, my internet seems to be being loopy. I'm, I'm sorry, there's oh. quite a few. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, mm -hmm. So what about vellum? Somebody was wondering about goat skin because you were talking about parchment and someone was wondering what about vellum? This is Raj, you are the one that posted the uh, question. I'm at RIT and I work with Dr. Easton. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, vellum of course is calf skin and uh, it's a form of parchment and um, uh, you know, uh, paper and parchment also, you know, you know, react uh, 
uh, you know, in slightly different ways. They both uh, are capable of fluorescence. Uh, parchment is a little bit better. Uh, the hair side of parchment or vellum, uh, especially vellum is, is a subset of parchment, but we often use the term just to mean parchment. Um, the hair side is usually absorbs less ink. And so if it's been palimpsested, it, it, it usually doesn't uh, preserve as much of the undertext as we'd like, uh, uh, whereas the, the flesh side does. Uh, but yes, uh, it uh, fluoresces uh, in various ways uh, and depending on the quality of the vellum. Yeah. My second question to that was, does the material have to be absolutely dry or can they work with wet samples or damp samples? Um, one could. Let's hope that you do not have any wet uh, parchment. My men discovered I items, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, usually what happens is the con conservators need to uh, stabilize the object first. If we're imaging and it moves, i.e. if it shrinks or, it, or, or it, it changes its shape, then the images that we take in sequence don't register. And so that, that we, we wouldn't do. We would want to make sure that the object has properly be conserved, been conserved first. Great. Um, someone was wondering if you've done similar work with paintings or if similar work is being done with paintings. Yes, we have. Uh, and uh, usually uh, painting, to, to discover pentimentos is often what people are thinking about. Those are the underpaintings, kind of like you know the, the undertext in a, in a palimpsest. And with the thickness of pigment, usually uh, what we do is either we work in with silicon sensors whose, whose range it goes only up to about 1,050, 1,100 nanometers, or we work with infrared reflectography, which has a different sensor, an in-gas sensor, uh, and has has lower spatial resolution, but can you know um, uh, it can use uh, infrared at about seventeen hundred nanometers, and therefore penetrate more deeply through pigment. And so, yes, that's uh, frequently used, uh, especially in gas and in reflectography for paintings. Although I would say that MSI for conservation is much more important and is hugely, hugely valuable. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to read this question out loud so that I get it correct. Someone is asking about the Turin Shroud. Um, they say the Turin Shroud is the most studied relic. In 1978, the STURP team applied imaging techniques to understand how the image was applied to the linen cloth. What are views of the authenticity of the shroud based on imaging techniques? and the support of the Hungarian Prey Codex, which documents the image of the Turin Shroud to approximately 1230 AD, thus dating the shroud prior to the carbon dating results? Okay, uh, let's say a couple of things. First of all, the Shroud of Turin has been very well studied and uh, the, the really most important thing are material analysis of it, uh, carbon dating is among them. Uh, and uh, it leaves no question that it is a medieval production, no question whatsoever. Uh, so let's say that right in the very beginning. Uh, the second thing with carbon dating and why the imaging results can be you know, greater or lesser is that uh, carbon dating, depending on, uh, on, on the sample and also the time period uh, and uh, the amount of carbon and whether or not you have particular markers, can be, you know, can, you know, bracket a range of 150 years. Sometimes if they're very specific markers, it can be very precise, uh, but usually not. So, uh, uh, those kinds of, th there can be discrepan discrepancies in dating and, and that's to be expected. It's not unusual. But once again, thank you for that question. And, and the Shroud of Turin is interesting. We have done imaging of, of cloth before, especially with blood. Uh, and um, I can tell you that the, the you know, the, these, kinds of, these kinds of fluids, uh, chromatophores in blood and, and various other things like that react very, very differently. And interestingly uh, in multispectral and have their own signature. Great, um, thank you. Um, someone asks, can you talk more about the software you use on the image capture side and also the processing side? Sure, um, uh, we use a system made by Megavision, which has uh, a, a software called Photoshoot, uh, which allows uh, for very, very precise control of everything from exposure uh, to uh, you know, capture protocols. It, uh, it creates uh, flattened images, it does calibration, uh, it creates multi-band color on capture. Um, and it's it's complicated, but it is extremely flexible for the high end. Um, and as for processing, we use two different softwares, one developed by Keith Knox, a member of the team, 
called Hoku, which can be downloaded from uh, uh, the archive website, the Rochester Cultural Heritage Imaging Visualization Education Group. Uh, it's at r chive.com under software. That's uh, Hoku, H-O-O-K-U. And that is primarily a deterministic imaging software, which is relatively easy to use and very powerful. And the second is Envy, which is uh, much more expensive. It's originally used for uh, remote sensing uh, and it's made by L3 Harris. Uh, and it is particularly good for statistical algorithms and some, some high-end uh, algorithms used for filtering and, and, uh, and handling those things, but it is expensive and Hoku is free. Okay, thank you. Next question. Have you worked with any materials aside from parchment and goat skin, for example? I mean, materials such as silicone or rock sediments that have solidified. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. I've, uh, we've, we've worked on a variety of things from metal to wood, to uh, uh, cloth, to rock faces. We've done, we've done cave paintings, several cave paintings, um, uh, to, you know, things like amatl, um, which is uh, pounded fig bark used in, uh, in manuscripts made in the new world. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, a, a range of, a range of objects. A range of, of substrates, I should say. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do you or your team receive analysis requests from police slash law and order institutions for forensic purposes, or are those kinds of needs typically fulfilled using less specialized equipment or expertise? That's a really good question. Um, uh, the answer is no, we don't, although we have a, a, a couple of times uh, have had a fair with that. Usually what happens is that the uh, forensic teams use, are, are looking for blood and they use, in order to detect it, uh, UV, uh, uh, a kind of deep UV. Chromatophores in blood uh, fluoresce at uh, uh, 253 nanometers, around 253 nanometers, pretty close to that. So that's kind of dangerous, and uh, that's something that um, forensic uh, forensics uh, will do uh, independently. However, we have used UV is very effective for lifting fingerprints off objects, manuscripts. Uh, there, I will say that there's uh, there are, there is a fingerprint on uh, the Gettysburg Address, which I'd like to try to see to match with Lincoln's. Uh, there are various techniques that that one can use using UV to lift fingerprints, though. Yeah. That is super cool. Um, the next question, um, Adrian Canino writes, can you talk about your data management process? I know you were working on it a few years ago. We met a few times, hi again. I'm thinking about things like annotated data slash images, metadata, intermediate product organization, final records management, et cetera. This is a, this is a huge problem. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it, it's one that does not have an easy solution. The, the problem with multispectral metadata has, or, or uh, actually all, all multispectral data is, is technically metadata. So what you're doing is uh, in taking an image of an object, you're creating a series of images which are all related to the parent. And once you've created those series of images, say you, say you have 30 images of every side or 35, already a lot of metadata, then, uh, then you have to uh, process these images and each of those are children uh, as well, or you know, daughters of the original. All of this has to be somehow uh, traced with uh, unique identifiers. And uh, this is a process which, uh, um, in, in which there's a real divide between scholars and scientists. Scientists want to assign a global unique identifier with the ability to, uh, to uh, assign at the end of each little image you know, you have main address for the for the parent, and then you have a, a series of little addresses, uh, numbers at the end, which refer to that back parent. Uh, however, uh, curators usually don't like that. They want to have the name of the object in, the, they don't have just a series of numbers. It doesn't mean anything to them. Uh, our own system uh, uh, assigns unique identifiers only to data that uh, we have processed. Uh, and then we try to limit the number of images that we release. We keep most of that data behind a firewall. Uh, and so if anyone wants to go back and trace some of the data that most people don't see, they can, then they'll have to use um, 
uh, our, our system. Otherwise, uh, we use a, a system which the conservators like. Is it great? No. Uh, I would, would love to continue solving this problem, and I appreciate the question. So we're at time, but we have a couple more questions. So I'm just going to keep going if you don't object, because these are really Not good at all. Questions. Sure. Like your work with manuscripts thousands of years ago, do you foresee using the techniques you described to decipher what has been written in silicone chips? Sometimes writings only exist in that medium, for instance, computer chips, for example. Thank you. I don't have any experience with, uh, uh, with that kind of forensic recovery. Uh, in It's analogous. But the technologies uh, used for recovering inscript, inscribed texts are, I think, probably somewhat different. And here I'm out of my area of expertise, so I can't answer the question effectively. I can no doubt see that uh, the kinds of work that's being done to recover damaged dr uh, you know, drives, for example, CCDs, um, uh, not CCDs, uh, damaged, damaged drives, uh, will in, in, in the future, is going to be something like what we're going to be doing, what we're doing here. But how that actually works te technologically, I'm not sure. Okay, and then I actually have a question, which mm. is how do you know what's worth scanning? So if something's damaged, obviously, like with the, the charring or whatever, obviously, or if you have some indication that there's something behind there, but like on that one uh, image that you showed of this seemingly beautiful, clean piece of parchment where there was all this stuff, like how do you know, how do you know which things to scan out of all the, the stuff there is? How do you know what to scan? And that's a great question because you don't. The system that RIT is developing is what I call the discovery system. And it's designed just for that. It's designed for, uh, uh, for to be inexpensive, easy to use and easy to deploy. And then for your rare objects, it's something that you could learn to scan yourself uh, or image, I say image rather than scan, uh, to image yourself and to discover whether or not there are hidden elements to it. Uh, and it can frequently, if there are, of course, it, it, it increases the value of the object dramatically um, uh, and can pay for a system. So I'm very much in favor of the, you know, certain good quality uh, and up to standard low end systems like the one being developed at RIT. And if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, please contact me or you can go to the archive website uh, uh, where you can learn more about that and cont contact people at RIT. But I think that's a that's, I think that's probably the way to discover. Uh, there are also handheld things. There's a, a, there's a, 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 a UV and IR digital microscope made by, uh, called a, uh, I call it Dino, D-I-O-N, D-I-N-O, the, uh, the Dino light. You can buy those. Uh, and I usually carry one of those around in the field to be able to analyze, but it's not as good as, as imaging an entire, entire object, especially if you're you know, in a library and you have, have a series of objects. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then I just had one other question. You talked about like charring and certain kinds of damage. Is water damage, like if something is old and water damaged, are these techniques good for seeing through water damage or not so much? Yes, very much so. In fact, my first project, what got me involved in this was a, a manuscript. The, the, the last medieval poem, long medieval poem, uh, epic poem, never to have been edited, uh, exists really in only one manuscript, uh, com almost complete in one manuscript. And it was in Dresden, and it was damaged in the firebombing in Dresden, not by far fire, but by water, because the, the, the cellar was inundated with water afterwards. Uh, and so what happened was that it was, it was basically washed, and it was a real mess. And then it was restored afterwards, and that also damaged the text. So yes, water damage is quite com uh, common. It also often causes other things like mold damage, and uh, mold sadly can fluoresce quite a lot, and that can be a problem. But yes, uh, we frequently deal with, uh, with water damage. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of people are expressing their appreciation in, in the chat for what a great talk this was. And it thank really you. was, it was really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. It was um, a real pleasure to speak to all of you. And I, I, I immediately, when I say that if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me uh, and uh, I'll be glad to uh, uh, talk to you about them and answer the best I can. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, everybody see you at the next session. Cheers, bye, bye. thanks.